Hey everyone, welcome to chapter four of Conversations with Curtis. Uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, I'm Paul Morgan Stetler, and back in 1996, I played Curtis Craig in Sierra Online's uh, full motion video game, Phantasmagoria 2, A Puzzle of Flesh. And this is the fourth installment of my oral history project, uh, celebrating the 25th anniversary of the making of the game. Now, for those of you who have seen the other episodes, you will notice a very different look to today's show. We're trying to spruce things up visually a bit. Uh, and as you can see, I'm, I'm hanging out in uh, Curtis's living room, thanks to fan and Patreon member Romulo Desati. Um, during last month's uh, stream, my guest Voidberger showed up with the WinTech office background on her screen, and it was so cool. I thought, damn, I, I need to steal that. So. I reached out to Romulo, who a couple of weeks ago um, posted these amazing upscaled videos, uh, or not scaled, upscaled screen images from the game on our Discord channel. Uh, they're amazing. I'll show them to you in a little bit. And uh, I asked if he'd be willing to send me two or three background images to use for this month. Now, not knowing that Romulo is an overachiever, he sent me 66. So let me show you a couple of the other ones here. Um, let's see. This is. Uh, how about, there we go. I'm hanging out in the corridor of WinTech. Uh, let's see, there's some more. There's WinTech right there, hanging out nice. Um, I love, let's see, there's, oh, we gotta go to the Dreaming Tree, right? Gotta hang out at the Dreaming Tree. <laughs> uh, let's see, yeah, there's the borderline. And I think for now, I'm just gonna hang out in Dr. Harburg's office. It just seems like a warm, inviting place uh, where people might want to talk. So thank you, Romulo, for, for creating these for me. They're really fun and I, I appreciate it. Um, speaking of Discord, we have made our general chatter channel open to the public. So please join us if you are so inclined. Um, we're pretty much stuck with this ugly URL until we are either verified or we get to level three, which I have no idea what that means. But at that point, we can have a vanity URL like Convos with Curtis or something. So, so come join us. There's about 60 people there right now. It's been fun uh, interacting. I'm still totally new to Discord. I feel like I've, you know, I'm hosting a party and and uh, people are kind of waiting for the music to get started. But um, uh, but so yeah, come join us and let's let's uh, let's get the music started. Let's see what else. Um, this is going to be a great show today. Uh, my featured guest is uh, Fantas 2 composer Gary Spinrad. Uh, Gary's musical uh, score for this game has been universally praised for its moody, gothic atmosphere. I, I cannot tell you how many people over the years have told me how much they love his work on this game, and, and I'm really excited to talk to him about it today. But before I bring Gary out, YouTuber and all around creative genius, Ross Scott of Accursed Farms will be joining me to talk a bit about his 2019 video review of Fantas 2. Uh, I reached out to Ross back in March, just before I launched this project. And he was kind enough to write back and has served as a kind of digital spiritual guide for me ever since, which I don't think he quite bargained for. But luckily, he accepted my invitation to join us today, and I'm really excited to finally talk to him in person. But before I bring Ross out, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about Patreon. I usually end these streams with a Patreon ask, but then it dawned on me that most of you have kind of checked out by then, so I am going to hit you all up early today. Uh, I'll make it short, I promise. Um, if you've been paying attention and following this project, um, you probably realize it's, well, for me anyways, it has grown in ways that I, I never imagined that it would when I first started. And as a result, I am putting in a bunch of hours preparing for these streams, lining up guests, finding all the video assets, curating fan art, creating fun promo videos for each chapter, marketing, engaging on social media, working with Daniel Albu on that P2 mini game. Um, writing monthly newsletters to the patrons, which I'm supposed to do as soon as the stream is over, uh, the Discord channel. Anyways, it, it really has become a full-time job. Um, and if you like what I'm doing and you'd like it to continue, I really could use 
some more support. The people who have been supporting me, I, I can't thank them enough, but I, I could use a little, little extra. So please consider joining me on, on Patreon uh, so I can keep providing these episodes. Uh, you can join for as little as $3 a month or for as much as you can afford for as long as you can. Um, now, of course, being a Patreon member doesn't work for everyone, but if you'd like to share your support in other ways, I'm wide open to it. And here's an actually a, a really good example. A huge Fantas II fan from Greece named Fotis Mavrakas reached out to me recently. He owns a very cool website called retrocomputers.gr, which celebrates retro computers and retro video games. On his site, he created something called Retro Computer Project, showing an old PC with thousands of games installed, including, of course, Fantas II. And if you look on the monitor there, you'll see there's a, a little picture of Curtis Craig down at the bottom of the monitor. Very cool. His project got a nice mention in the magazine PC Master, uh, where he also published a review of the game back in 2007. I would love to read an English translation of that review because it's all Greek to me. But anyway, uh, it better be good, Fotis. Fotis was kind enough to make a one-time donation today, supporting conversations with Curtis in exchange for me, letting you all know about his website. So this last minute or two of chapter four was generously sponsored by Fotis Mavrakis of Greece. Thanks, Fotis. And if anybody out there wants me to mention a project you're working on or during a future stream or a shout out of some sort, email me, let me know, and I'm sure we can work something out. Okay, let's get to our fan art section of the week. Um, I'm Some cool stuff came in uh, and I really wanna, not, not a lot this week, but I wanted to share with you a few. And the first one um, was sent to me, uh, I'm trying to line up things up so I can see the, the stream. Um, the first one was sent to me by uh, Eternian Machen. Uh, he sent it to me just before last month's stream and I didn't have time to get it in. And there it is. That's uh, Curtis hanging out in his living room. Blob, looks like Blob's got the wallet back there. And uh, that looks really great. So thank you, Eternian, for sending that in. And then I just stumbled upon a couple of uh, Twitter uh, posts from 2020 that I thought were really fun. Uh, one from Apocalypse Cowboy, uh, where he writes, um, let's see if I can see it here, but uh, he writes, hardly a good game, but a fascinating one all the same, <laughs> which I thought was very funny. I posted that, I retweeted that yesterday, and it got a lot of response. And, and actually, I think I may have gotten Apocalypse Cowboy into some hot water because a lot of people said, no way, man, it's a great game. But I thought, not a, hardly a good game, but a fascinating one all the same would be a great blurb to put on the box. Um, also, I was a little dis disturbed by him realizing that Curtis would be needing reading glasses at some point. So uh, he seemed to uh, create Curtis in the future, me now, as opposed to Curtis back then. And then the other one that uh, we, we came across was from Electronic Beth on Twitter. And this was when Voidberger was doing her stream and uh, she wrote a bad case of the Mondays, can't stop the raw sexual power of Curtis Craig. Woohoo! hoo um, Voidberger is streaming Fantas 2, which is the most iconic, weird body horror queer FMV game, in my opinion. It's a good mouthful, weird body horror. I'm not sure if she meant bloody horror or body horror. And if she meant body horror, is she talking ab about my my dad body, is that what that is? Is that a horror? Is that part of the horror uh, aspect? I don't know. Um, so thank you for, for that cool uh, art there. And then what I wanna do now is I wanna show you those upscaled photos that Romulo posted on Discord. Um, what happened was um, back in 1996, Sierra Online posted about 40 low resolution, about 300 DPI GIFs of the game on their website. Romulo downloaded those and he went to work upscaling them. And uh, they're incredible. You can just see how, how clean and clear that is. There's Curtis, you know, being kind of creepy and looking at uh, Joss and while she's sleeping. Uh, there's de the detective with the, 
the big claw coming down, but it's just so clean and clear. And it really gives you a sense of what a remastered uh, version of the game might look like. When I asked uh, Romulo how he did this, he said uh, that he used an app called Topaz Gigapixel AI, and then he cleaned the images with Adobe Photoshop. The artificial intelligence adds digital garbage to the images sometimes, so we had to manually clean it to make it look as natural as possible. But I just think it's really amazing. There's Curtis and Trevor, just before Trevor gets his, uh, his unjust end. Yeah, there's uh, Jocelyn, which we realize now she was in on it all the time. There's Zombie Tom coming at Curtis. But yeah, just look how clear those images are. They're amazing. There's a couple more. I love this one. That's my favorite um, of Jonas and the, the KY Jelly Curtis uh, coming out of the, the Hecatomb. Um, there's Therese Rachna just before the... Uh, the swing, uh, Paul Warner saying, you'll never, what does he say? Something, he says something about like, I'll kill you or something like that. And then I think the last, there's two more, there's Bob. I love that picture, that's amazing. And then I think the final one, I love this picture because it is, um, where is it? I think that the stream is a couple seconds behind, but the last one is, is Gary, uh, uh, there's Andy Hoyas. That's it. So Andy was the director of the show and uh, he had a small cameo as a uh, someone in the uh, uh, insane asylum and uh, they were going to put him into the Dimension X, but then he has a heart attack and dies. So he had like a few seconds on mine. So that's our director right there, famed Andy Hoyas. So nice work, Romulo. Thank you so much for, for making that. I will try to make these all available on our Discord channel with Romulo's permission. So you can take a look at them in more uh, clear detail. Okay, so that is it for fan art today. Um, I do, though, want to mention uh, Daniel Albu's P2 minigame. Um, it's, if you haven't played it yet, it's really, really quite wonderful what he's done. He's able to make, uh, to play on a browser, you can actually play a little bit of uh, Fantas 2. He's taking old footage from the game and we're adding new content and uh, it's a fun way to sort of explore Curtis' apartment and sort of combine conversations with Curtis with the game. And we have all kinds of different um, ideas of what to do next. And what I was thinking I would do today was I would maybe play the game, but I figured that would take a while. And I think that we'll, what we'll do is we'll save that for its own thing. So maybe in the next couple of weeks on Discord or Patreon or somewhere, I'll do a 15 or 20 minute live stream uh, playing uh, Daniel's game. And uh, so I'll let you guys know about that when that happens. Okay, that is it for that. Let's see, um, here we go. All right, we're ready to get started. My first guest today is Ross Scott of Accursed Farms. Ross is a very popular YouTuber. I think he has well over 300,000 subscribers and he's best known for the series Freeman's Mind where he provides a very funny stream of consciousness voiceover for the silent protagonist from the first person game, Half-Life. Uh, Ross also made several 3D shorts um, animated with computer game graphics. I think he has some more coming up and he hosts the YouTube series, Ross's Game Dungeon, um, where he explores and he gives his thoughts on various video games, including a really entertaining and informative review of Fantas II uh, back in 2019. I'm gonna show you a short clip from that video right now. Let's, I hope this all works, let's see. Here's the boss's office. Here's the boss's honesty, office. I imagine most successful honesty, managers have repressed most urges to kill managers things. Have repressed so if urges anything, to it's probably things. better for everyone so he gets anything, it all out in the open like this. better for everyone he gets it Let's all go through out in the stuff. open like this. Let's go through his stuff. Oh, he's here. Oh, uh, he's uh, here. Yeah, I just work uh, here. Uh, bye. Yeah, I just work here. Uh, so I bye. guess we should actually work. 
So I guess we should actually oh, crap, work. My password. Uh oh, guess my password. Damn, what was it? Change my password. Uh -oh, it's blob. Guess my the password's blob. blob. You're such a pretty girl. Blob. It's blob. Boy, doesn't that remind you of the nineties? You're such a pretty girl. You could get away with a four character password being the name of your pet. You could get away with a four character password being the name of your pet. And it being clearly labeled right next to your monitor. And it being those days are gone. Did you know that for 15 years yeah, the those launch codes for all the nuclear weapons in the US were 18 years the launch codes for all the nuclear weapons in the US were it wasn't like just one guy knew it was all zeros it was shared with pretty much all base personnel nationwide now in the UK as late as 97 or you know after this game was made they were just securing the nuke launch controls of bike locks but back to the game security really was like this in offices for oh Trick or treat, Curtis! So, Ross Scott, if you want to come on, turn on your camera and come join us, please. There you go. Hey, Ross. Oh, well, welcome to Conversations with Curtis. How are you? Good. Uh, is the audio good now? I saw yeah. the chat saying it was double. No, I think we're good. I think we're okay. Were okay. you able to hear? Were you able to hear all that when you're? Oh, I, I don't know. I muted that end, so it's okay. fine for me. But <laughs> uh, so I don't literally hear triple. Yeah. If yeah. I've done that. So. Well, hey, thank Thanks. you. For... This is great. You're... Yeah, my pleasure. Hey, so so if you does that watching that video clip bring back any any memories? Oh, I, I guess. I mean, I for some reason I, I don't really like seeing stuff of. When I'm done with the videos, I almost never watch them again. Something, I've heard actually that some actors, well, didn't Paul Mitri say this last time? He didn't really like to watch himself. Most people don't. What he'd already done. So. Yeah, it's really hard. You end up just. Yeah, just, I don't know. I mean, if I guess if I was playing a, an odd character, it'd be more fun. But if it's just me talking, it's like, I don't know. It's something uncomfortable. Right. No, I get I'm it. I'm glad other people like it. <laughs> it it's well, something in my brain that like, it, it works while I'm editing, and then once it's done, it just turns off. Yeah, so. yeah. What do you? Um, well, what what, what strikes me about what what strikes me in that clip, uh, and we talked a little bit about this just before uh, we we started broadcasting today, is the fun rabbit holes that you like to go down um, during the review. Um, it seems to me that you're fascinated by the fine details of things, and so uh, what I loved about this was like taking the fact that Curtis forgot, you know, says he forgets his password. And then, you know, this, the, the progression of how easy passwords were back then versus today, and then thinking, well, what was it like with the government? And then finding this, uh, you know, the, the passwords of the double eight zeros and stuff. Yeah, my brain just connects dots on various things. Uh, I mean, this has been brought up to me before, and I think I'd have to blame this on me, just general public education where in school, I really trained myself to just kind of daydream because if it was a class I wasn't that interested in, my brain would just wander off places. And now, if anything, it's overdeveloped. So I see all kinds of patterns or this reminds me of this and which reminds me of this. And there is this actual logic to it. But if I just throw it out there, it, it's I could see where it might bewilder people. But Absolutely. No, it's fun. It's really fun. Um so it's fine. Uh, tell me about what, what, tell me about what you remember. Yeah. You, you made this, this particular game dungeon review it was a little over a year ago, I guess now. Right. Yeah. It's more than two years, something like that. Yeah. What, uh, what prompted you to choose Phantas 2 during that time? It was, well, it's one of my all time favorite games. I mean, when I started making the game dungeon, I knew eventually I'd want to cover that, but it's also a big game and I wanted to kind of do justice. So I wanted to work up to it and the Halloween was coming up then. So I want perfect for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a perfect uh, timing for that. Yeah. What? Oh, go ahead. That was a great quote you had earlier about the, it's not a good game, but it's fascinating. You know, I'd agree with the gameplay, the gameplay, I think maybe doesn't hold up the test of time, but everything else, I love it. So. So what's the difference between, so when you first uh, played, when did you first play it? When's the first time you played the game? I think it was in 98. Oh, wow. It actually worked to my benefit that the game kind of bombed because that means I was able to get it cheaper than I would have. <laughs> I, I probably wouldn't have played it until much later if it hadn't been, I think I, 
I think I got it for ten dollars. Wow. When I, I actually got that. Yeah, I think it was fifteen actually when I got it. What happened was my father works as a computer programmer. Every once in a while, he would go to these computer shows where before internet commerce really took off, that was the best place to get deals on computer parts. That there would just be these computer conventions where they have people be selling a lot of hardware or some games. And I saw that there, I was like at five CDs. I already knew the, the first, I already knew about the first one and was interested in this, and this is $10. Oh, I'm kidding. Like I, I, I've been wanting to play the first one, but this is what is available. So it's sure. <laughs> so, yeah, and it's not like you need to play the first. To, to, you know, they're, yeah, they're so and I, I guess I got kind of lucky in that this was the equivalent of uh, kind of sneaking into the theater when you're underage. Yeah. But I, I, I could handle it. I mean, I wasn't, it wasn't giving me nightmares. It, on the contrary, I found it. I think it was old enough by then to tell the difference between stuff that's more adult but it's just kind of there for shock value versus stuff that had more content to it. Yeah. And it, it was just s- s- hooking me right in. You know, what like, was it at first? Like, what was it that grabbed you? Was it the, um, Oh, there's so many things that, that I'm learning about this game now, after all this time, having sort of put it away for a while. Um, and it really has to me anyways, it has a lot to do with the, uh, identity struggle you know and and um and is that something that you think where was it more just like the the craziness of the story that was happening yeah that's what's so great about it is there's a lot in there for people to kind of latch on to different things uh i think i think i was well i was generally in the spooky stuff in general but i think when i was just completely on board was like after the first night when you know it, it because you're, you're kind of getting these hints of things happening and then you see the what's yeah then you arrive at the office and everybody's just in shock you know they can't even tell you what's happening and then you're finding out what's happened to bob it's like whoa yeah. it's, and it's that contrast from starting off with this pretty mundane office day that i really love things that build yeah you, you know yeah. that start off slow and I guess the other, besides the general craziness, I've always been a big fan of the sort of theme of just going off into the unknown. And for even though the majority of the game just takes place in an office building, it's loaded with that, you know, where things keep escalating. Like, um, like I, I keep thinking of, it's different, but I keep thinking of something like Heart of Darkness, where he's just descending further and further down the river and you don't know what to expect and things oh, are getting great. wild and uh, I, i've always been a huge fan of that kind of storytelling yeah and, and 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 like you said the craziness of it all it's like while that there's so many things to latch on to because you know there's the murder mystery aspect of it but then there's Curtis kind of struggling with reality versus what's real or not. So, and you're not sure either as the viewer. And then he's having all these relationship issues that are just compounding. <laughs> and then, and then, then he's having psychological problems, you know, with the therapy session. So it's just like, let's just keep adding more and more. It just, it turns into this pressure cooker of things that are going on in his life. So I was just kind of, yeah somebody said fascinated by all this like wow and the game just keeps upping it <laughs> just so i have a question day, so it's adding to it you know? so when you as a you know again i i'm not a gamer so there and i think that so for me i always felt like we were making you know a movie of some sort just felt you know the set felt like a movie the story it was it was a strange way of making it but but as as someone playing it as a game does again this particular game in the 90s they were trying some new stuff they were you know this this ultimately didn't take off but what's it like you know i I would think that as a gamer you want more control more often you know you want to be able to just go from here to there and that's where the first person stuff kind of took off but but what's it like having to just be patient and watch scene after scene after scene or you know is that something that took some time to uh just settle into well there's different types of gamers i mean before this, you actually had, uh, well, by the publishing company, Sierra, they had a lot of, I'm not, I'm not even sure nowadays what the proper term is. I call them 
back then they called them graphic adventure games where they would actually have usually drawn or later painted backgrounds where a character would walk along and then you have to talk to people and solve puzzles and the flow of it is actually very similar to Phantasmagoria too. It's just the Phantasmagoria and games like that, you had actual actors where the past would all be drawn and just text blocks and then later right. they would get voice actors as technology progressed. Yeah, yeah. But, so I, I've always been okay with either of those. Gotcha. However, the thing is with gaming, there's a lot of different types of games where um, you're absolutely right. Um, where some gamers just would never have the patience for that. Then, now, whenever. And I think that's those part of it. Of games, they want to go in and they want to shoot the monsters that are coming for you. <laughs> yeah, or, right. you know, and I think that's wanna, kind of the pushback we got with our, our game a little yeah, bit. Some people just but, did not have the patience know, it's, for it. Unfortunately, yeah, um, those are the ones that tend to dominate the, the gaming field in terms of sales. But, well, now, especially, we're seeing all kinds of different yeah, yeah. niche interests that just can kind of merge for people who do want more of a story, yeah. you know, or in, enjoy the interaction. You, you know, like I was surprised, even the emails, I actually felt surprisingly lifelike that the, the interaction where you, you send it and then later in the day you get a reply and then you can choose what to reply. That stuff I so, didn't know about. I mean, I never knew about that until starting to do research on it. Cause like, again, I hadn't played the game. I remember, you know, I looked at all the, the video footage and the, in the, in the film, you know, the, the, the scenes. Uh, but it's only as I started watching people's, you know, uh, playthroughs and kind of getting a sense of it that I've realized how much of this <laughs> was mundane yeah. office stuff you had to go through. Yeah, unfortunately, Phantasmagoria is sort of a, it, it, it's sort of, it's like a Venn diagram where there's this tiny sliver to exist in because there's people who want the adventure games, but then the gameplay was, was kind of cryptic in areas, which I kind of throw off some of them. And then at the time, the industry was getting kind of wowed by, again, more like the shooting games or more realistic graphics where you can kind of, you, you don't have to rely on the backdrops. You can just turn the camera yourself, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it, it, it's all, it was, it might, in retrospect, it might've been kind of doomed to get receive a niche interest, but um, someone's going to say, ah. So. No, that's all right. You know, it's so funny. I, I, you know, you and I, I mean, I've, it's so, it's kind of surreal talking to you right now because we've, um, you know, I've watched your videos uh, and I've seen some of your, you know, you have some uh, talkbacks with your, your, your fans. And I, so I've got a chance to see that. Um, but, you know, I reached out to you, I think you and I've kind of become pen pals since, since March, I reached out to you back then just before this thing started and uh, had seen your review and a number of people had said, you know, you really should reach out to, to Ross Scott. And so I looked you up and, and you were kind enough to respond. And I think that uh, it's been, it's been fun, you know, using your experience to kind of figure out how do I get into this, into this world of, of, of sharing online. Yeah. The, you know, that was, that was pretty surreal for me too, like getting an email from you because again, in the game, you write, you're writing to people. So it's like, <laughs> oh, wow. It's like, I'm actually writing to Curtis. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, no, I want to show oh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go, go, go. Oh, I, I was going to say, it was actually a nagging down the back of my head. Cause I noticed you did an interview before this that I stumbled into, I think it was like a year last year with uh, somebody in Northern Europe. I forget. Yeah, I mean, where and I was, I was kind of bugging me because sometimes they do follow ups to the videos. I'm thinking, oh, maybe I should try to reach out to Paul Morgan Stetler. That'd be pretty amazing. It's like, well, I don't know. He he answered almost everything I would ask him in the in this interview. I, I don't want to just reach. Thing. So it's gr it's great that it worked out like this. Yeah, and I remember well, I, I was going to say. I want to share something with you because. Oh, um, sure. Go ahead. Um, you. Uh, you may not remember this, but uh, I guess shortly after you did your review. Uh, you ended up reaching out to me on the on my YouTube, uh, my Letters Aloud YouTube channel. Just oh, real, yeah, yeah. real sweet, you know, message. I think we actually have a- I didn't know how to contact you. That was the first I saw. Right. It's like, so, a, oh, wow, I have to leave a comment, you know, so. So you probably won't be able to see this, but the screen capture uh, says, let me see if I have it right here. You uh, you wrote, big fan, Phantasmagoria 2, knocked it out of the park. Good luck on your projects. And this was, you know, you yeah. had found Letters Aloud. So I said, thanks. You know, I was trying to create these video letters of the week. I hope you enjoy those. 
a far cry from the horror genre, but a lot of fun in its own right. And then you responded, and this is, I think, very much in, in keeping with what you were telling us about yourself. You wrote, I heard one of the oldest correspondents in existence yeah. uh, were these Sumerian clay tablets complaining that a merchant was a cheat and his goods were of poor quality. That one might be worth looking into for your group. And um, the funny thing is, is that I had heard about that Oh, and I'm not sure, you'll have to probably watch the, the replay of this, uh, Ross, but um, uh, we're going to show the actual image of that Sumerian clay tablet, oh, wow. okay. uh, which is amazing. It was written in uh, 1750 BC, um, and it is one of the oldest letters of complaint ever. Uh, apparently, uh, I think it might be one of the oldest correspondence yeah. ever. You know, like, like, like yeah. this is our, this is what we start history with, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. It's just the guy, <laughs> like, like some merchants. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy Nani, uh, a Babylonian copper merchant, uh, bought. You know, he was he was a consumer, and he bought this copper from E. A. Nasir, and Nasir, I guess, didn't sell him very good quality copper. And was also very verbally abusive to Nani's servant. So at one point he says, what do you take me for that you treat me with such contempt? Uh, so, so I love that the very first letter is all about poor customer service. So that, that, has, that has remained ever since. Um, well, listen, I want to ask you a couple quick questions about um, sure. your projects. And then, I, then we'll, um, I, I'll bring Gary on and then you'll go away for a little bit. And I'd love you to come back and join us in a, in a little bit. But um, when I first started to look at your, your work, Freeman's Mind, um, what you're doing there, and again, I'm not that up to speed on, on this, but I, I, I feel like, you know, there, what's the line? There are no new ideas. And I feel like you found a new idea that no one else does. Not doesn't. really. No? Uh, well, let me just, before no. the, if people don't know what it is, let me just share real quickly. What you yeah, do sure. is that you do a first person narrative of you know that the first person gamer so that in this particular game you you give thought to all of your you know uh adventures trying to navigate a certain element of that game and you've created a personality based on that and it's unbelievably funny and it really makes the game just even more dynamic to watch so it just seems to me that you're the first person ha has done something like that or is doing it in the way that you you do it's it's sort of like taking an old idea and just applying it to a little bit different medium. I mean, it's the the first instance I know of this is uh, an old Woody Allen movie called What's Up, Tiger Lily. Yeah, where he went and bought the rights to this kind of cheap Japanese spy movie, scrubbed all the audio, and then filled in all the lines with just this funny stuff. So it's I don't know what the original plot was about, but in the movie. They're trying to find the recipe to the the best egg salad sandwich recipe or something like that, and, and then there's one scene where this they're trying to this bartender is trying to intimidate the guy with showing this snake like eating a in a cage and he's saying oh uh, my snake it's it's going it's getting married to a chicken it's like I always cry at weddings <laughs> like he's so it, it's it's loaded with that stuff and then more popularly popularly uh later a lot of people probably heard of mystery science theater 3000 yeah right, right. where they would you know buy right by the rights to bad movies and then just insert dialogue constantly right the, right so it, it, it's very much it's in the been same there way. but i just haven't seen anybody do it in the video i'm not game. sure yeah. if i was the first to do it for games or not i, I still don't i'm not aware of others who did it Although when I first did that, I received a couple of emails. One guy was annoyed because he said, like, oh, he was going to do that, but I beat him to it. And another person thought I stole the idea from him. Of course. Which is just coincidence, you know? Yeah, so man. it's, I mean, I did that, I want to say something like eight years after the game came out. So there was a window there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really, for <laughs> sure. Well, the last one that you did was just, just hilarious. I hope people get a chance to see it. Um, okay, so I think uh, it, I should probably uh, scoot a little bit. So uh, Ross, if you don't mind, thanks again so much yeah, no for joining problem. me. It's a pleasure to chat okay. with you. And then great. Yeah. I'll talk with Gary for a bit and then I'll bring you back. And I know you've got some questions for him too. And uh, we'll just, just hang tight and we'll see you in about uh, 30 minutes or so. Oh, yeah. All right, thanks, man. All right, oh, that was so much fun. This is so great. Um, 
I just love how this Fantastic Two world is is getting bigger and bigger in my world in my my eyes here. Uh, all right, I am so excited to to bring Gary Spinrad in. Gary is a composer of many video game soundtracks, including Leisure Suit Larry, another Sierra, uh, Casino, Enforcer, Dungeons and Dragons, Heroes, Ultimate Spider-Man, Call of Duty Two and Three, World at War, Black Ops, Black Ops Two. He is also the lead singer of the Memphis Strutters, where Gary performs as Elvis Simmons, a mashup of Elvis Presley and the Kiss bassist Gene Simmons. Uh, so Gary Spinrad, please come out and say hi. Prepare for disappointment. <laughs> hey, buddy. How are you, man? Hello. <laughs> you know, I've been thinking, I don't know if we ever, did we ever meet during the, the um, during were you on were you on set were you around i was on set actually all the time uh it was a, a really weird arrangement uh for composers I, I since learned you know very few composers are actually around when the shooting is uh being done but i just felt i could front load so much of this stuff i was i was you know screw the rushes which i got anyway but i was there so you, you were know? on set watching yeah, i was watching the takes yeah absolutely oh, wow. I, I I was so in my you know just I was so out of my mind trying to well, figure everything out. I don't know if you remember this, but you literally lived right next to me. Wait. I leaned leaned over the balcony once and said, "Paul, wait a minute, where in Queen Anne? In Queen Anne, on the um that yeah two fifteen Valley Street. That was the greatest apartment. It really time. was. I love that place. You, I had oh, the, I, I miss it. In my bedroom, I had like a window. And I had about that much of a view of the Space Needle. I mean, I could just, I could do this and I could see the Space Needle. I had the same, but yeah, what a location. I mean, oh, that's so funny. I don't, I, I can't believe it. I, that was an amazing place. And I'm sorry, I don't remember that, that moment. How long were right. you there? Uh, let's see. I was there probably until uh, 97 yeah. when I headed for Factoria. Okay. Yeah. I went to LA down in 97. After yeah. that. That was, I was there for about a year. The, the really nice thing about being in that area is we were in Seattle during Seattle. So and that time. was really the focal yeah. point. I mean, I remember Kurt Cobain died. Yeah. And there's a thing. Yeah. Oh, I'll just walk the two blocks to the thing. Yeah. I lived oh. in, uh, when I was filming Fantas 2, um, I moved into that apartment because I actually had a little money and I was able to move to a nicer place. But, uh, um, I was in a little studio apartment in Capitol Hill on 19th, and I was around the corner from where they made the movie Singles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember like exactly where that place was. Yeah, so I was just right around the corner from that. So there was all kinds of fun stuff. Then. And the funny thing is, for a while, just before I started in my game career, I worked at uh, Tower Records Mercer, okay. you know, which is the flagship, and that's where everybody came. I just yeah. like, I'd look up and say, oh, hi, Mike, Mike McCready of Pearl Jam. You know, it's just yeah. it was just the epicenter of town it was yeah how did you get the gig how wh where were you at in your career when you... that was really really weird uh that was uh, i think a screw up on my part and a screw up <laughs> on their part honestly because um i don't remember the producer's name but he was a tremendous Matthew thornton i remember him yeah he was quite the talker and quite yeah. the hollywood type he was yeah and so this dumb kid comes in. I mean, they already sent uh, uh, through uh, my friend Ricky Cleland a, a, a tape <laughs> of what I was doing, which was, you know, this. What I was trying to do at the time in my general music was kind of a cross between what would symphonic metal sound like if it was with techno industrial instead of the uh, metal. And that style, which I was referring to as techno gothic really got me hired sight on scene. So Thornton calls me and says, well, what do you want for, for, a, for a price? And I said, well, uh, I need to le make at least 2000 a month. And that's not the usual. It's like, it's like 20,000, uh, you know, after the rushes, but he knew that he had some dumb kid on the line oh, and he right. thought he was going to get away with uh, a good score for a lot, not a lot of money. And essentially he was right, but it gave me the shot. Yeah. And and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, to be honest. I mean, I had a music degree. I mean, I, I got I graduated with a degree in composition and performance voice from Franklin and Marshall College, but I'd never done film scoring. I was just doing this style of music. 
And I, I knew I wanted to do it, but I didn't he know found, how to get he, in. He found you through the, some of the tapes that you were doing. Yeah, were one of the tapes from somebody who worked there. She just went, listen to this. Okay. But you did, did you know that person? How did she get your tape? Oh, she was in a, a stupid industrial band with me and in, uh, in uh, yeah, me d- dumb shit trying to do an industrial band in Seattle. That was a great idea, but that's who I was. So yeah, gotcha. That's it kind gotcha. of who I am. Wow. Okay. And so this was, was it, would you say this is like your first real big job that you had? Uh, was Frankly, this- it was my first job. Really? Yeah. Did you and- feel, what did you know going in? Did you have that? Did you read the script? Did you have that? Oh, key? yeah. You, I you, did everything I could do. You yeah. know, I didn't, it's one of those situations. I, I really feel it's, it's amazing what one can do when one doesn't know what one can't do. Yeah, no, it's so true. It's so, so true. I was like, what naivete what, is, yeah, uh, can be your, what should can I do? Friend. Well, read the damn script. Cool. We'll go watch the filming. Cool. What uh, do you, you remember know, about the script? Uh, very little at this point, you, you know, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was, it Not was really. always thinner than I thought, <laughs> you know, uh, I I've always been kind of, of amazed that usually a feature film, uh, boils down to about 90 pages. And I'm oh, like, this one, the one that I had was like 400 pages. It had every sort of, I got, I got some sort of, because it had all the gaming elements and all the other the things. The thing is I got it in, uh, edited increments. Gotcha. Gotcha. I don't know if that was for, uh, brevity or security, Yeah, but that's how I got them. Right. And so you were on set watching every day and did you not have every a, day, but yeah. Yeah. But did you have a sense going in? So you knew what, what you had provided for them that got you the job. So you knew that you were in a realm that you were already. Oh, I knew what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. They said, do this. And I'm like, cool. Right. I, I didn't even break stride when I started this stuff. The only well, difference with what I was doing is there isn't any vocals. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And uh, then we got, the, I think yours is the only, ours is the only game, if I'm not mistaken, at least back then, where they actually added an act, your song at the end credits that actually had vocals. That was not known at the time, right? Well, it's a common thing for film, you yeah. know, end credits rolls and the, and the, the single plays. Yeah. So I, hey, let's do that. And yeah. I've got this song that was from that, that band that I mentioned. That's like, listen, this band isn't going to go anywhere. And it didn't. But this song, Rage, this this song is good and it's applicable here. Yeah. Let me just move it over. That's great. That's yep. great. I, I want to Lorelai rewrote the lyrics from the original and I just recorded it with everything I had from the original song. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't know. I didn't know that yep. Lorelai played or uh, worked with you on that. That's, yep. uh, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about Rage in a little bit, but I want to... I've been making all my um, guests, and I think I just have to make you do it too. Uh, I'm not through. walking on my hands. No. Nah. <laughs> this was in the contract. That's right. Um, I want to hear your life story in three minutes or less. So you got to tell me. I want to hear birth to... I've been making everybody stop right around um, getting their job at, at Phantasmagoria too, but but I feel like people have been zipping through it so much. So I just want to hear the highlights, lowlights of your life from birth to right now we're going to put a three minute timer on Ugh. as soon as i see it on the that's a couple seconds later but it is so jason when you put that on there i'm assuming it's going to come on usually i'm looking at the okay the stream so go ahead and just give us give us the lowdown of who you are and where you came from and what you're doing i grew up in albany and corvallis oregon uh i was there uh I was always absolutely always a musical kid singing everywhere I went. Uh, you know, when my, uh, my dad uh, graduated with his PhD from uh, Oregon State, I ended up in Maine for two years, but then back to Corvallis for the rest of high school. It's where I made some of the best friends of my life, and I was very happy there. Uh, after that, I went to college in uh, Pennsylvania studied music, uh, and I kept doing what I'm doing. I mean, I play rock and roll yet i'm really serious about my music and you know really like good detail uh after college i worked in dc for a while uh and then returned back to the pacific northwest which is how i ended up back in seattle and uh, you know i always knew i wanted because i grew up in really booger ass oregon i wanted to go somewhere where something happened Mm -hmm. i mean 
one of my frustrations down here in LA is all these people. Yeah. When I was 16, I saw it, social distortion at a thing. And it's like, I had none of that. You know, I was, I wanted a more urban place. I mean, mm-hmm. shit, I, my first concert, I didn't see it until uh, I was 17 because it's such a spiel to get up to Portland yeah. anyway. So I got to Seattle, did a bunch of Joe jobs and then uh, started to land the job, you know, with uh, Sierra uh, from Sierra. I started in music and then I went to music and sound and uh, then music and a lot of sound. Uh, and after Sierra folded, I went to uh, Microprose in Baltimore. So I had to rip my wife out of her where she was. And um, I was a composer, sound designer there. And that studio folded. Hmm. So I end up heading for Los Angeles and Treyarch. Uh, that was the end of my composing, hmm. actually, because One thing I learned and everybody's got to know is that the gulf between people who are really, really good and absolutely professional is wide. Mm -hmm. And I was very, very good, not stunningly good. And this is what you need is the stunningly good. But my sound work was getting that good. So I had a job. It ended up being uh, the Call of Duty series. And I was making good sound. I'm very good with guns now. <laughs> and uh, I'm really good with guns, actually. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, after Sierra burning out there, I went up to Oregon for a while and Ben Studio and blah, 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 blah. Last few years, I've been underemployed doing hired gun things. But now I'm the uh, audio director for Free Range Games. And I have four people answering to me and it's a wonderful environment and they're great people. And I love working there. Oh man. Congratulations on that too. You and I talked a little bit. It sounds like there was a, you know, it's, it, this is the perfect end to a dry period that, uh, yeah, yeah. It, happen, right? it got bad. Yeah. Yeah, no, but, yeah. Well, that's awesome, man. So, so, um, in terms of, uh, where, where it sounds like your dad and my dad, what, what was this PhD in? Uh, uh, oceanography, oceanography. Okay. My dad was a, English professor. So, you well, got to, yeah. let's drop this thing. My, my father is, was confirmed by the Senate uh, one month ago as the undersecretary of commerce, head of national oceanic and atmospheric administration. My dad is the head of NOAA. <laughs> that was awesome. Congratulations to your dad. That's fantastic. And there's nobody more qualified. Trust me. Yeah. It's so hard growing up in a house that with somebody that smart. You can see through you like glass. Yeah, I've been, I, I, I hear you. I have that. Um, yeah, I got you. Well, listen, I want to, um, let's see. I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, as I, I, as I was knowing you were coming on, I started to watch all the Fantastic Two scenes again with the real, you know, just listening to the music. And one of the things that I noticed uh, and um, was how each room that, you know, apartment, Wintech, wherever, has their own, its own sort of soundtrack. And, and, uh, and what I, it was really, and I'm going to play a couple of clips for you uh, from each of these environments. And I just feel like they all tell their own story. And I was, you and I talked a little bit prior, just as we were setting up for today's uh, stream, where we talked about how, you know, it just continues to get a little bit, you just know something is happening the closer we get into, into different environments. And so I want to show, just play a little bit of, uh, you know, Curtis's apartment. It's at near the, it's the beginning of the, of the game. You, it's pretty heavy with piano. Uh, let's just play a couple seconds of it here and see how this, this works. So tell me a little bit about that. It feels to me, I'll just let me share if what I, is that I feel like that this environment isn't dangerous, but it's not necessarily relaxed. And, and, um, and that piano gives me a false sense of, you know, of relaxation, but then there's something underneath it that's telling me that that's, 
it's 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 not quite there. I'm just kind of curious what you thought about and, and how purposeful this was, because it feels like it's consistent in Curtis's apartment. It is. Uh, you put your finger right on it, actually. Here's here's the deal with that. It was as simple as I wanted. We're at the beginning of the game, so we, this is about the most reality we're going to get for some time. And uh, that's why I use the piano, an organic instrument. Uh, but I did want the tension. You're absolutely right. I used a lot of suspensions uh, on that piano thing. And then there's that one little fluty thing flying around up there, kind of disembodied. Yeah. And that was the disembodied thing is what I wanted you to be paying attention to is that yeah. uh, reality's down here, but what the hell is that? Yeah. Yeah. And part of the way this these you mentioned one for each room it's partly the way the engine is structured you know one of the things i've learned and i'm very qualified to do now is uh music engineering which is a thing unto itself but the thing is you need something to happen in order to trigger the next change and early on in um early on in, in game sound engines were handmade at best uh you know there wasn't a lot of off the shelf stuff to do fun things like, like f mod or wise now but so i had to say changing rooms there's a good trigger changing rooms there's a good trigger you know i saw so the whole apartment was one thing but the minute you hit that door that's when the trigger went yeah and but also let me just share another thing with you because uh what i what i thought was fantastic was later in the game you know, as things, the shit's really hitting the fan and things are going bad. We still go back to the apartment sometimes. And there's this one moment that it's still the piano, but it's different. And there's this wonderful discordant. I'm going to just play the, play the moment where he opens the strong box before he sees his dad's letter. <laughs> Let me just show you this right here. I mean, there's nothing other than the piano there. And that's the first time I think I recognized where there was just one instrument and there was no, it wasn't filled by other things. And again, there's this pleasantness to us, but it just keeps making you go off. And I, I just, I, I, what were you thinking on? Do you remember that moment? That, that was absolutely conscious. And I'm really happy that you picked up on that because what I was trying to do with the very first few notes is a total, you know, uh, hallmark you know hallmark memories of you know the really squishy schmaltzy shit but then it doesn't resolve like it should mm -hmm. and it's pretending like it's a hallmark thing but it's just failing yeah yeah <laughs> you know time, yeah <laughs> so you know i would do a couple things that's within a key and then a couple things with just true horse shit <laughs> and then just resolve on something else that sounds about right. And then, and then there were moments where like of silence, you know, like you, ex you expect it, the, the chord to come in and then it doesn't for another beat. And you're well, like, well, that's what I was trying to do is give you little bits of something supposed to be happening or yeah, something yeah. is happening. I said, what the, the I, I was never wanted you to feel resolved. Right. I mean, something that Wagner did in Tristan Unisolda he never had a 5-1 cadence bum, bum in the entire opera. Wow. Everything was unresolved. Everything was a false cadence until Tristan and Isolde were dead. And that was 5-1. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. So That's I was amazing. doing pretty much the same thing. I was giving you hints yeah. of correct with a whole lot of... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, let me let me play. Now we get to WinTech, and this is the you know, this is the first you know I, I think this episode or this is Curtis's first entry into WinTech, and uh, again, it's totally different. It's the the mood has changed, but it doesn't you know there, there's a progression. It's not it's not dangerous yet. But let's just hear this.
So now we're we're getting into something definitely more gothic, I guess, for for, for my limited perspective. But it just it's taking into taking us into a, a new world, right? And that new world is not a fun music like experience. Uh, uh, yeah, that's kind of well. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about music in just a second, but I, I really wanted you to step into that cubicle and just go, yeah. <laughs> what just, what, what just changed? Yeah. You know, and of course it's the music, but you know, some, something's different now. And mm -hmm. the fact is, as I was saying earlier in one of our previous meetings, I was giving away the story farm. Every time you walked into one of those cubicles, I told you in sound or in music, what was about to happen. And I was wondering when Andy Hoyos would tell me to knock it the hell off. And he never did. Well, it, cause it's, <laughs> it, it sneaks up on you because you end up getting so caught up in what's happening in the story. Again, for me, it wasn't until I decided consciously to focus specifically on the sound that it started to leap out at me. But when it's part of the whole, you're creating something. It's, it's not as, uh, blatant as, as it seems when it's just that but when and it was ham-handedly blatant <laughs> <laughs> well here I, I, I will give you an example of of it taking it to the next level so what we just heard was everything in the cubicle world and now we're going to go into uh the um the storage closet or the storage room where of course the portal is to dimension x and we know now that this just has a completely different feel to it in fact i'm not going to play this but going into Warner's office is also slightly more uh, elevated, but that's, let's watch the, the, the storage room. That, that, that high pitched sort of, it feels like a, a spring sort of uncoiling in some weird way. You know, we can often, as composers, people can convey a lot, and great composers convey a lot more. I mean, if you sit there listening to John Williams, perhaps the most famous purveyor of leitmotif in the world, you can just sit there and listen to the story being told. Well, at that point in my composition career, I was really focusing on just very simple communications and what i was trying to say really clearly as possible is one word no i was like, trying to say no in like that don't, room don't go there yeah it's like yeah. no this is not where you want to be oh, that's no great. that's, that's great. that was my focus i love it and who and, and most people's many people's response to don't do this is to do the exact opposite, right? We're monkeys. <laughs> um, all right, well, that's that's awesome. I've got, um, man, we could go on forever. I've got a whole bunch of questions from our, our Patreon members that uh, wrote in. I asked them for some, they, they, a lot of people want to have questions for you. So I'm going to read some of these off. We'll, we'll zip through these a little bit and then we'll bring Ross back out. And then um, I've got a couple more um, uh, bits of your your score that I want to share when when Ross is here, but let's dive into some of these questions right here. Um, I'm not sure how he pronounced his name, Rarapas. Uh, I think this was uh, one of the YouTube comments. Uh, well, he asked, "When did you?" Yeah, I guess we actually have this this answer. He said, "When did you compose the soundtrack?" It was pretty much throughout. It was it was happening. Yeah, it was largely concurrent. concurrent. Yeah, you know, a lot of the cut scenes I had to wait for them to be edited. Uh, to do through composition on on those things, but the shall we say the structural music that was done by the time you were guys uh, were filming, yeah, or done finished filming. I remember um, you probably were here. You were probably there for that. But like I remember, we had been filming. This thing was supposed to be a three month shoot. It ended up being ah! six months or something like that, yeah. right? And I remember we were, you know, plugging away, and we were. Um, we had been doing, I don't know, we had probably been a month or two months in and, and it was intense. And I remember at one point, um, they sat us down and Wes Plate, the editor had been asked to create, which ultimately became the, uh, the, the trailer, but they just said, I feel like, I think that Andy thought that uh, 
that the morale was a little bit low and he wanted to figure something out so that we could all see what we were creating. And so he sat us all in this, I think we all went into one of the Sierra rooms and he sat us down and he played that, that one two minute trailer. Uh, yeah. And that was, I think that was the moment where we all thought, oh, okay, shit, we're making something. This is, this is really, really interesting. And, and that, that score, I'll never forget hearing that for the first time with that trailer. So yeah, that was, again, it was all happening at the same time there. Everything was going on, you know, as we were filming, they were throwing everything over and everybody else was working. Oh yeah. On. Shit was being thrown over the fence. Right the yeah. Center. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was honestly, on, I, I see watching the other end and being on the other end. It's like, what the yeah. hell is going on? It was, a, it, was a, it was an impressive machine they had over there for a while. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Gon asked, who were your influences? The Max reference. I love the Max. Oh, sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, I grew, there's a bunch of things that I grew up on. Of course, you know, my two primary interests throughout my entire life are Kiss and Devo. So oh. Kiss, that big theatrical thing with simple powerful music and devo the little science geeks you know who uh i still love to this day and th those two dichotomies really have uh have guided my music at you know the the techno thing the the the, the te music technology thing has always fascinated me so kmfdm uh nine inch nails uh especially front 242 there's a lot of front 242 in this record plus there's the other it has to my pro my personality and that's the quest for what i call metal and metal is anything from you know the actual heavy metal to something like um the score for conan the barbarian huh. that is one, just if you can listen to battle of the mounds and not have your blood burn then you're not my species. Anything that gives me that, you know, be it classical music, be it film score, be it Jesus, just a, a, a New Zealand uh, rugby team doing a haka before a match. It's like, yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of that in my personality as well. And that's where these things came together. That's great. That's great. Um, uh, let's see. Connor Eck wanted to know. Uh, oh, not Connor. Damn yeah. it. <laughs> Connor, he's always, uh, he wanted to know if you had any advice for aspiring composers, sound designers. Composers uh, get extremely good. At this point, everybody is going up against all the top composers in the world. And it's easier than ever to, to be smashed like a bug. Mm. So be incredible and expect that you're going to have to spend about 50% of your time trying to get a gig and maybe 50% of your time, assuming you get one of those gigs, uh, all, even when you have a gig, be getting your next gig. Yeah. Trust me, because yeah. there's no such thing as an in-house composer anymore. Right. Right. What was your honor? You can ask me more of this offline. No worries. So yeah. I'll give it, give you all you need. Okay. He also asked, what was your, what's your favorite piece of music equipment? You know, uh, to be honest, I'll, I will never get over when I first got uh, contact the uh, audio uh, virtual instrument system. It just opened up an entire world. My old uh, my old rig was an Ensonic ESQ one and uh, Korg O three O three W R. I miss that Ensonic terribly because it had just this wonderful digital analog hybrid sound and so much of the came from that esq1 but most of that vocal swishy stuff came from the korg unit so i really do miss those as well um there was a when i was doing the score for a uh, for um swat three there was a Casio C C Z one, I think it was, that had get that ticket to death ticket that and it was had a sequencer in it that really lined up with my rig very well. So that I got a lot of mileage out of that one. I really like that piece. Nice, nice. Um well we I think this is a good chance to chat about um uh 
Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a couple of couple of questions. Uh, so just in general, for anybody who's watching right now, we will get to a little bit of a live Q and A, uh, but it's going to be a little bit later on uh, down the line. So so if you have some questions, hold hold off on those for a little bit. Um, so Gerald Gerald uh, wrote, uh, I really love the trailer music. Uh, do you still have the original full quality recording, and would you make it yeah. available? So I think that there's a, there's a story uh, that might be worth sharing here. We the all my original stuff was lost. How, what lost, happened? yeah, lost in the fire. So you know, just I, it would have been hard to keep keep it in the first place with media being what it was in those days but I just don't have it anymore. You know, the, the originals are lost. I'm sorry. Can you share what the story was? And that sounds fairly dramatic. The fire, what was, what was that? Oh, it was, it was actually a, a very localized thing that just took out a bunch of my rig. So wow. not much of a story there. Okay. Wow. I know that, you know, as, as people have reached out to me, some people have, and I think I've tried to forward everything that's come my way that there have been certain you know, tracks that have, uh, that have survived in some form or another that have found its way to you. But I don't know if any of that is, uh, would be considered original or not. Uh, frankly, it would be considered original given the technology of the time. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's not, none of it is compressed. Uh, therefore it is pretty close to what I originally conceived. Yeah. You know, there's not much degradation. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Jessica Newton asked, were there any unused tracks? Were there, was there, was there music that, that never made it into the game that you, you, uh, or did you pretty much everything get in there? Probably. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not too sentimental about things that didn't make the cut. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's like not working, right? Not working. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and it, I don't give it a second thought after that. Yeah, you don't mind uh, killing a few babies if not if at all. Yeah. No, that's part of the process. As a matter of fact, I find a good, well-earned failure is probably more instructional than a success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Um, what uh, is there any favorite music you have of other games? Are there other games that kind of blew your mind? Fuck yeah. Um, one of my favorites that you guys have probably never heard of is Interstate 76. It uh, was a game that was released in about 96, 97. That was an alternate Southwest U.S. Um, the government had collapsed and everybody was driving around the Southwest with guns on their cars. It was car wars. Uh, but everything was set like a 70s, uh, shall we say, black exploitation movie. So everyone talked like this, and it was really cool. And man, the soundtrack was pure waka chow. And man, if you 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 drove a car called a Picard Piranha, and your mentor was Taurus, and he drove a Cadillac, and every time you hit the C button, he would read bad poetry over the CB. <laughs> <laughs> and that awesome. score was so good it was insanely good and cool. you know getting into the more modern scores you know jeremy soul's um uh, skyrim score damn i mean that's for video games jeremy soul's skyrim is probably the star wars of video games Okay. I mean, it was so well done. I mean, you know exactly when Alduin's theme is coming in and you know what's going on. It's just a masterwork. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, let's see, what else here? Uh, what, what's your favorite What's your favorite music or tune or whatever uh, from Fantas 2? What's the one that you, you love the most? That you, it, any, it's any, gotta any, be Rage. Yeah, the, the, the song. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, for sure. Um, what about you had talked to me when we first re you know, connected to, to talk about this, you had mentioned to me, and I want to play this for both you and Ross when he comes back, uh, the, uh, Teresa's death scene. Mm. You had talked about, um, about just how we, we I want to just sort of have you talk us through the, the, the build of that. Uh, do you have it around because I'm, yeah, we will. I'm we'll, struggling we'll to remember it. Okay. Now we'll get a chance to, to listen to it in a little bit. Um, okay. uh, Let's see what else favorite tune. Like I said, I lost a lot of material and I, I don't remember it that yeah. well. And I don't have a, I really don't have a means to play the game anymore. Yeah. Um, 
Let's That's see. why that that thing that uh, the guy in, was it Israel cooked up, the walking through that was like, oh, I get to play again. This is cool. <laughs> um, I'm getting a couple of other comments that have come in. I'll you know, so wait on this in a little bit. Um, the uh, is the word jerk among them. It, it, numerous Probably. times, numerous times. Yeah, so, that's yeah, well, what I thought. I'll, I'll Let's see. Uh, Jessica also asked, and I think I actually have this, so I'm going to play it for you in a second. So um, uh, she said, what was the thought process when creating some of the otherworldly tracks like ones used for the Dimension X scene? So when Curtis goes into the other world. So let's, let's, if we can, let's go ahead and just play this for you right now. I think I have just one little clip here. So what I remember, and tell me this must have affected you as well, is that we ran out of money and Dimension X just got chopped. I mean, it was supposed to be a huge yep. you know, uh, event and we were going to spend a lot of time creating this world and there was going to be all kinds of adventures and game plays and it ended up just being truncated. Did that affect, do you remember that and did that affect you and your- I uh, remember it extremely well and I remember- <sighs> I remember talking to uh, somebody in production uh, that's like, well, what do you want me to do? I mean, you, you just huck this at me and you know, you, I can't exactly save the film with music. So I was kind of like, well, do what you can. Mm -hmm. So I did my best with what got hucked at me. Yeah. What did you think and, about that moment? Uh, what, what is it? What did that feel like? Just listening to that again. Well, uh, actually it felt really nice. Cause I, I haven't seen it in so many years, but you know, my first thought after having 25 years more experience is like, man, you could have done more with that. Hmm. But on the other hand, sitting there, I was listening to that uh, patch that I was using. And I'm like, yeah, I remember what I was trying to do. I was trying to convey a simple mood that was no longer. No, hmm. what it was is maybe. <laughs> so I was trying to create a simple pensive hang. Yeah, you know, that's, that's where we were first trying to thinking about, are we really going to step across? Are we going to cross here? You know, just. Yeah, I love that. That's great. So it was simple, maybe too simple, but that's what it was. Yeah. Um, okay, a couple quick, a couple more, and then we'll, uh, we'll bring Ross back out here to, to chat. Um, so there's been talk ever since this project, Conversations with Curtis started, I think there's a there's some you know, for the hardcore fans and the people who still just really uh, see the value in this game, there is, um, there's been talk, A, of a remastered version, and I don't know how that would, would come about, but uh, also um, being able to, uh, A, you know, there's, there's been other conversations about like maybe figuring out a way to realize Lorelei's um, ending. ending which we never got to like in some way, maybe not with the actual actors, but maybe through, uh, you know, animation or it was some kind of cool way that we can figure out what that was. And, uh, and so Mr. Gon uh, asked, uh, do you have any contacts other than you worked at Activision that could help with acquiring Phantas 2 licenses or anything like that, or getting them involved in, in a project like this? Yeah. Yes. And no. Uh, yes. I've got a lot of contacts back at Activision. You know, Treyarch was part of Activision. Uh, no, in that that's a department. The legal department is very separate from the devs. You never let the suits uh, be around the devs and you never let the put the devs in with the suits and near the, the, two shall ne'er meet yeah yeah so unfortunately you know the ground the impetus between for um redoing phantas is going to have to come from public interest activision isn't going to lift a finger unless they think they can make money yeah yeah i hear you exactly but it's a relatively easy thing to remaster if somebody out there cares yeah and then that leads to me to the final question. John Magnus uh, wrote, uh, if that were to happen, would you consider making, or what would it take for to remaster your your soundtrack? Would you consider being involved in that and helping re recreate or remaster those uh, 
those tracks in some way or another. Oh, hell yes. Are you yeah. kidding? Yeah. You know, what would be really nice is for me to take the original tracks and maybe just sweeten them a little bit with something mm -hmm. else, with something modern. You know, that might be fun. Yeah. On the other hand, it might be, uh, I, I want to tell you a bit of a story. The structure of the game's music was based on uh, a 1978 film called The Warriors. I love now, that movie. God, yeah. I love that movie. Yeah. And the best part of The Warriors was this lull, this tense lull. And then ultra violence and yeah. then tense lull yeah and then ultra violence and that's exactly what i did with this score and the reason i bring up the warriors right now despite the fact that it's relevant yeah. is i will kill anybody trying to remake the warriors it is perfect yeah, it is of it. its time yeah anything else will be less yeah 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 so, no so there <laughs> You know, I'm not going to stand here and say my score is perfection. It's but not. It is what it was, right? But it, it is was, what it was. Yeah, you know, yeah, I. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to go dink with it, but you know, I, I, there might be a toggle where we can say original score and well, but Gary, again, Gary already... screwed with it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's yeah, good. I don't want to go all. I don't want to go all. Well, we re-edited re a new hope. Yeah, uh, that's that's great. What did you do? Well, that's like Apocalypse Now. I mean, that when when um, Coppola went back and did that 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 you know that extended version, it it really to me it it, it ruined something that was beautiful to me. You know, Precisely. It, you know, and uh, it just it actually there was a reason that it got cut out, and and you don't want to see. I wonder so. how hard it would be to do a a remaster where you toggle between absolute absolute. Uh, uh, fealty to the first one and we did some stuff yeah that yeah. would be fun that would be fun yeah all right well that's gonna th that's our questions for that so now um if ross if you're still there i'd love to bring you out i hope you've been uh uh hey there you are if he took there one look at elvis simmons he's probably talking to the water heater <laughs> actually i was telling the chat to go watch detroit rock city good film that's because <laughs> you kept mentioning kiss yeah well uh yeah actually that's been done what you were describing the switch back and forth between original and i think was it the secret of monkey island had a oh what a like that what a, that, great, that's a good soundtrack it's a great score and what a great script is oh that a, yeah. is that a game i think they did a remake curse of the curse could, of monkey island yes all right it's, it's another uh it's from lucasfilm but uh, it's the adventures of a would-be pirate named Guybrush Threepwood, and it is just the 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 the, the dialogue is just spectacular. Oh, cool! I got to check that out. Gary, were you aware of the game that, uh, uh, or Ross, were you aware of the game that that Gary mentioned, the, what, what, oh, the Interstate seventy six? Yeah, I played a little bit of it. I, I know exactly what he was talking about. I, I think the original uh, game Driver has a similar soundtrack. <laughs> yeah well i hope we didn't uh steal all your questions no uh, no you still uh, you stole the the more broader one so i was happy for it uh yeah well one thing i wanted to loop around on one thing i definitely noticed you're probably not the first person to do this but i couldn't think of where else i'd seen it you mentioned the beginning track of the apartment with the piano music which kind of has like this somber feel to it, but you know, still calm. And I noticed as the days progress, it's getting more and more off tone because you can tell Curtis's world is unraveling. And so by like day five, it's just almost completely off and atonal. Uh, was that inspired by something or it just came no. to you or? No, I just thought that is the way it has to be. You know, the yeah, first one is the, we start tonal and, and things work like you expect. And then just the rules start leaving. I, I you know, this stuff. simple, this simple rule is gone. It's like as simple as, okay, you can't use your left hand to eat anymore. You know, that is the, that is the level of what the hell? 
I was trying to do is really simple and it's building things. because the day progresses. I mean, the game progresses through the week, you know? Yeah. Uh, and you know, I, I was trying to take away little things in the music, really simple resolutions that are, are endemic to Western sound and just not doing them. It's yeah. Really- you know, in the chat, you're making it sound, well, I mean, maybe this is how much you were thinking about it consciously, but you're making it sound so simple. However, I and mean, from a certain perspective, it is. However, the emotions, it's just, you nail it so well that it produces these feelings that just it has this sort of majesty to it that even if it's meant to be simple, it's it's a beautiful weaving, you know, you know what I mean? Um, oh, thank you. Like actually one of the tunes that always pops up in my head thinking about the game is just the map music, which is, and it's just a few notes, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, the map mm. music. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny. One person is, I think I've had more than one person say to me that they have played us. I think it's mostly the, the music in Curtis's apartment. They, they would have that as something sort of as mood music. Uh, they would just have that, that play in the background as they were working or whatever. There was something about that, that really, uh, connected to them so you know as as ross said you know well that's more telling of them i mean it's like <laughs> hey but this is this is common music mind, but simple some, pleasure so. something, yeah, yeah. well I, actually what i was saying is deeper than that really you know that means their world is basically correct with something wrong mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that tells me you, that something is wrong in their life and you know you mentioned connecting that with it I actually found part when you guys were talking about I actually found parts of like the day one piano music and in the cubicles, like the, the background element kind of comforting on a level like so it is. Yeah, it maybe really maybe that's some psychoanalysis. Well, that is precisely what happened into like I said, I was trying to convey simple one word emotions, you know, serene. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Happy I mean, memory. It, it's, it's more mixed Fuck. in there with that. But. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, well, it's funny because I always think about like, um, you know, you created a, a sort of uh, a, a creative box within you had to work in and you, it was, you know, you had, you couldn't get outside that box. And so you made this decision that you were going to, you know, uh, create a mood for each room and that each, you know, as the game progresses or as you get to these different places, you know, as you said, you're, it, you said it was a, you, you were taking a hammer to it, but that's the box you created. But what I think what Ross is saying is that within that, you couldn't help but, but utilize your creative, you know, curiosity to find levels within all that to, to make it work, you know, and that's what I think people are responding to. And that's, that was essentially my job, in my opinion, the way that it worked is, like I said, I was giving up the farm. I knew what the resolution of that, uh, section of the game was going to be we uh and beforehand but the player didn't what i was doing is composing for that resolution and it will make the music will make sense when you get there mm-hmm. that was yeah. the whole point i was also going to say you almost might be overthinking it because of course i am from a music yeah <laughs> you're coming from a music background the player is playing this and they just finding themselves liking this mood you know or wow this really fits or they're making it tense so it's as blunt as you're saying it is it it really works and in fact a, a pet peeve of mine is soundtracks that aren't very distinctive and so I really appreciate when a, a score has like a real solid theme and like, you know, it, it gets into your head rather than just, I've compared to some soundtracks, it sounds like there's something good playing, but it's in the next room. You know, I, I've heard where the, it's just not very well defined and they want it more as like a ambience, but not too def- The funny watery. thing, you mentioned the theme. One of the things that I thought was a bit of a failure on the game was the main theme. And I never played the whole theme completely until the end of the game when, we, when it uh, was all revealed. That was probably a mistake. You know, I kept putting a few notes of the theme on there. I kept putting, you know, hinting at the main theme. Maybe I should have just used the main theme a little more. You know, I was doing simple leitmotifs, but the the resolution of the game, I was toying with it constantly and never really presented it as a whole. Mm. Hmm. This is great. This ties directly into one of my next questions is, I, 
I would actually, you're talking about the main theme. I would agree that out of the soundtrack, that's maybe not the strongest part. Like mm -hmm. actually my, my favorite part was probably the portal room once you first enter it. It just has this kind of otherworldly feel to it. And again, kind of hopeful almost like- Yeah, just, that's what I was alien, going for. But hopeful. Do, like I said, had, I, I was switching this... from no to maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. that curiosity is like, is this, is this where I'm actually supposed to go? It's yeah. okay. I think you mentioned that you had, it was like the Korg. It sounds almost like pressure releasing from a valve in the back of like, shh, like while in the middle of the theme. But one thing I thought was great about the theme, so I would push back against you saying you should have used it more, is I was going to ask if that was your idea or the directors were, there's the menu music when you first open the game, like doo -doo -dee, it's kind of hazy, you know. And then you finally hear it again in Dimension X with that energy column. And I thought that was almost genius because I thought like, oh, now it's all coming back. This is what it was all about. Like, oh, this is fantastic. So I, I think for me, I thought it, that really stood out to me when I played it that you hadn't used that theme. And then now we're bringing it out. So it's like, yeah, now you get it. So, mm -hmm. I, and and I, that kind of elevated it. So it, that's not necessarily my favorite part, but the way it was used, I love that. So. Thank you. That was absolutely conscious. Great. Yeah, well, that that was what we call in hockey a dangle. <laughs> that so, was something to get your interest while I spun around the other side and took a shot on net. <laughs> yeah, well, that's so Gary. When I I, I reached out to to Andy Hoyos a while back, and we're you know trying to get him to come on uh, a little later, and. Um, and you know we chatted a little bit and when I, when i mentioned i was bringing you on the only thing you really we didn't really we were talking about other things but one of the i got the sense that he didn't give you he just trusted you and let you pretty much do your was there a lot of interaction between you and him that you remember almost not yeah i think that he said the same thing yeah yeah i mean basically he was reviewing everything he was sitting there while i was laying in the music with wes and you know stuff like that and he was just like yep yep Yep. yep, and he started paying less and less attention to me because I, I guess I was just, you, you did what uh, you know, wanted. Yeah. I, I was hitting doubles. You yeah. know, <laughs> <laughs> you don't mess with the batter when he's hitting doubles. Right, right. Um, all right. Well, listen, I want to share uh, this. So I'm going to share two quick scenes with you guys, and I just love your your both your takes on it. Um, the first one is when Curtis is at the Dreaming Tree with Jocelyn, and he sees uh, his doppelganger for the first time. And oh, uh, before I show that. I, I, the question I did you also do sound design on the game? The in game sound design I did. So everything like the chains going over the did you do all the well, all the, the, the all the stuff that's actually on full motion video that was done over at Clatter and Din. Oh, yeah. But I, the stuff like the very simple UI stuff and the uh, interactions with things in your uh, cubicles, that was me. Oh, wow. That's I was I was on I was there to make sound design in that game too. There's well, some, Really like cool. I said, my first my first shot, and it, it in retrospect, it turns out that I'm really really good at sound design. Yeah. I mean, I've made a career out of it. Yeah. Well, let me let me play this for you guys. Let me see what uh, tell me what you think of it because there's a really cool. It, it turns very very. Well, anyway, so I will I'll shut up and play. Kill that slut. Kill him like you killed your mother. So much going on in that moment, musically. You know, I always knew that there was going to be straight quarter notes whenever the Hecatomb was about. You know, do, 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 do. And if that does not come from Flash Gordon. That comes more from Front 242. And I was, when he was on screen, it was straight cam fdm you know and but that was like i said i was just establishing tension with a simple minor second in the strings uh and started the and whenever we had something supernatural i had this great patch on uh, uh the corgo 3r that had that singy thing and the bells coming in after it 
and man, it sounded good. And I used the shit yeah, out of it. Yeah, you did. Thing. That's what the, is that the part that came at the very end? That uh huh. It almost sounds I like I remember that. A few sounds times. like voices, right? Almost. Well, it almost that's one like... big part of my composition is use of human voice as an instrument. Yeah. You know, I just fill it out like it was a keyboard patch, and ah is the most one of the most useful things. You know, I use the, I use that to this day yeah. in my composition. Yeah. You know, it reminds me um, another horror soundtrack that a little bit different. The I think it was Carter Burwell did the soundtrack to Blair Witch Two, and I heard that for all of his instruments, he just went out to the forest and just recorded everything like rocks banging together, water, leaves rustling, sticks, and then just that was his sound. Those were his instruments for his soundtrack. You know, I have a story. Ten uh, CC the guys who did i'm not in love mm -hmm. so don't forget it that sound that that choir sound behind them what they did this is absolute engineering gold is they had a 24 track available to them and all four guys in the band would sing one note they say c ah uh, they would then they would stop that and they would sing d uh 24 tracks that's two octaves and they did an entire keyboard of people going ah uh, ah uh, uh. and so they turned up certain notes when they needed them that's how they got that incredible sound wow. so it was literally a voice organ and that is the kind of crap that i love <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know i mean i just uh, i just watched the McCartney 321 uh, on Hulu with him and uh, Rick Rubin just at a at a mixing board and just talking about music and isolating all the tracks and it's as a non musical person it it's absolutely mind blowing and in, in hearing you guys talk about all the different layers underneath it's just it, what what a wonderful way to if I may I, I would have killed to listen to Rick Rubin tear open tracks yeah but there's a YouTuber that I really dig. His name is Rick Beato. And he does a series that I just love called What Makes This Song Great. Yeah. And he will pull out certain hooks. He will pull out little pieces of composition. I mean, every once in a while, just for fun, I take a deep dive on the construction of Africa by Toto. And I always find something new that I didn't mm. notice, little suspensions and shit. Yeah. You know, and Beato is really great about that. He really gets to the kernel of a lot of songs. That's awesome. All right, I'm going to play this. I'm going to play the Therese death scene. So, uh, so for those of you who have never seen this game, Therese dies pretty horrifically, but you get to, I want to, I want to hear the sound that goes with it. And uh, what also someone uh, wrote on, on, on our stream right now, uh, asking about the Mortal Kombat music in the Bondage Club. Does that? I didn't, there was no Mortal Kombat. Oh, okay. That, that all was right. all Good. me. Okay, it was all you. But so, so the background music that whatever was playing and in, in the club that we heard that that was your your arrangement. Absolutely. Yes. So I think we'll hear a teeny bit of this, but it's really I, I cut it so we're just going to pretty much hear Teresa's death. But it really gets pretty. Um, there's a real incredible drive to this. Let's watch it. That's the background music there. Hello. Come on. Who's there? part is you, it's hard to get past the, the imagery because it's so intense but then when you really I, I almost was i was i was tempted to just play the the audio so we didn't have to watch it as well because it really uh, you're you're just it just goes bonkers and i'm, I'm and, and just there's so much going on 
with the club music, the sound design uh, of everything that's happening in that room, and then this bum, 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 and then it's just taking off. So anyways, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on that, both of you. What you're hearing is, um, first of all, kum, 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 is always the sound, the sign the hecatomb is coming and something is about to get fucked up. And uh, with that, there's a strong relationship between uh, the kind of fetish scene and bands like Lords of Acid, you know, which has a, a really high speed techno feel. And that is, I was crossing that with my love of metal going to double kick. <laughs> but it was a lot of Lords of Acid. And you can hear me just do a basic, uh, one flat five and a basic tri tritone a couple times back and forth and then set up a key center, do the same thing. But I was just going for this discordant, violent, yet and just berserk mm -hmm. sound that was still kind of like we're at a dance club and we're thrashing it up and we're uh, dying horribly. Yeah, to the point that the people outside the door, you know, feel like, oh, there's just something fun going on in there, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, if you heard Lord, that kind of Lords of Acid sound, yeah, you shouldn't go in there. They're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you mentioned the bluntness. Now that you mentioned it, I realized, oh, that's right. All the murders, yeah, the, the, those hit you like an axe with the bluntness. Mm -hmm. so, and if there's one thing like I'm you good said, at is you go bluntness. From, <laughs> you go from calm to just, you know, full force for all the deaths. I, I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay. Well, any, I mean, I'm gonna probably move on to some live Q&A. So anybody uh, that is wanting to ask uh, Gary a few questions, what's up? Um, and then, uh, um, but I have a question for you, uh, both you and Gary Ross before before you head out. And thank you so much for for joining us for this and and being a part of this and just helping me for, from the beginning. I can't, I can't thank you enough, but uh, I'm curious what you guys, um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm planning on continuing through the end of the year, and then we'll see what happens beyond that. I've, I've got a bunch of ideas. You know, there's so many different people that worked on this and so many different people that I could interview, but but is, I'd be curious, like outside of some of the biggies, Lorelai, Andy, people like that, I'd love to know your thoughts. Um, who would you love to hear from uh, that, that, uh, that might be, a, or that, that you worked with, Gary, that you think would be a great person to chat with, or Ross, just, you know, in terms of your, you know. If you can get a hold of Wes Plate. Yeah, I was thinking Wes. That, yeah. Wes was like the focal point of all of this. He was, yeah. he was the one actually putting everything together. Yeah. yeah. And just from a production standpoint, uh, much less his, the fabulous job he did putting things together. Yeah. Uh, man, I'd like to hear about him. And he's like, you want me to do what? Yeah, right. Wes is the drag, uh, the editor of, of the of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. What about you, Ross? Anything you'd be interested in? in Jeez, I mean, you're, you're checking off so many boxes as it is. I mean, I think it's great at getting to talk to you and the composer. And yeah. I mean, like you mentioned, Lord Lay and the uh, uh, director and a lot of the cast. So, I mean, there's not a lot of, you're, you're not missing much so, yeah. uh, from my perspective. Yeah, there's some, uh, I, I, reached, I really wanted to um, talk with uh, Matt Jensen, who was the, um, the, the, the DP. And uh, uh, it was, I think I'm convinced it was one of his first jobs. And now he's like a huge, he, he just did Wonder Woman 4. He's like, he's- Oh, really? That's oh, excellent. Time now, yeah, he's doing great. And he, you know, I reached out to him, and he was kind enough to get back. But um, uh, for various reasons, he he gave me a ten no. He gave me a pretty definite no, but I, I I'm going to still nudge him again. But I guess I don't know if you knew this, um, Gary, but I guess there was a there was a lawsuit with the with the crew, and Sierra. I think that there was some uh, some I don't know all the details, but uh, I know that that crew worked crazy hours, and I don't think they were union, and so I think there was well, some. That's that's the kicker right there is the video game industry and the film industry. One of the reasons that they don't really mix all that well is because of the unions mm -hmm. uh, video games. Well, let's put it this way. Uh, what I went through at Treyarch was 100 100 hour weeks uh, from February to October with under 10 days off during that period. I was expected every waking moment to be in my chair. Yeah, well, we're you glad go, you're still alive, Gary. I so am I. I was hospitalized <laughs> twice. Wow. 
Yeah, I'm not yeah. kidding. But anyway, um, the thing is, the film unions would never put up with that shit. Yeah. yeah. And you would that would the the hammer would come down really fast. And there's still a wild west aspect of the games industry mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. the big publishers frankly use us yeah you exactly. know we, it's been a problem for a really long time and you can see it with what's happening with activision right now yeah yeah we have some stuff going down um all right well listen i'm gonna scoot on ross thanks so much uh i really sure. really appreciate it um and uh everybody if you i'm sure all of my followers know who you are but if you haven't seen ross's work please go to uh, accursed farms uh youtube channel or his, his band, website yeah. And uh, uh, there's some there's some great stuff there, and it's just it's just really really fun stuff to go. I, mean, I can't wait for your next. Uh, what's what's coming up next? What, what can we expect from you before uh, time travel? Time travel. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Looking forward to it. All right. Well, thank you, Ross. And then Gary, if you don't mind hanging out for a little bit, we'll ask, uh, answer some questions here. Okay. I have nowhere to be. This okay. Is, this is my Saturday. Excellent. Um, so I disappear now. Or? Yeah, disappear. Good. Okay. Get out of here, man. Shoo. All right. See ya. Um, all right, let me see what I got here. Um, some cool stuff. Uh, oh, Void Burger's on here. Uh, okay, so she's <laughs> um, she wants to know: Did you did you see the dancing dudes at the borderline? The the two guys. The, remember the three guys that, that? Oh yeah, I was there. She says, "Did the dancing guys have any effect on the music of the borderline?" Not Chicken a damn bit. Situation. What's that? Not a damn bit. Not a damn bit. <laughs> uh, did you ever play the video game? Of course I did. Yeah. It's called making it. Yeah, I know. But did you ever actually play it afterwards? You know, I, I have a tendency not to play the games that I did because I tell you what, like, especially with things with Call of Duty, after a while, after you've worked your thousandth, hundred thousandth hour on the thing, you can barely test a bug because you never want to see this again. Yeah. 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 It's hard to, it's hard to, to, to go back to, to that. I, I've, I've yet to interview anybody who's worked on it. Uh, the other, uh, so far through the four. So it was Monique, Paul, myself, and you, we, none of us have played the game. Francois Demagella asked, did you guys, Oh, we did that already. Uh, El, Calavero, Gary, would you consider creating new versions of some of the piano themes from Curtis's apartment? There seems to be a consensus among fans that those are the most memorable pieces besides Rage. So I think that people would be interested in, in you creating that more of that work that they could listen to. I'm amenable to the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm. It'll take me a little time to switch because, like I said, I my rig is very much. Uh, set for sound now but one of the games that i'm working on has a heavy music uh, aspect so i've got uh, i'm getting the keyboard set up and taking that little side uh side trip wouldn't be difficult uh my o3r i still have it but it's in storage so i'd have to find it again after i find a place so yeah, uh, but I'm I'm amenable to it. Yeah, I think you'd get some you'd get some. Uh, to be honest, I'm a little surprised that that's what resonated. Isn't that something? Isn't that weird? How uh, it, it, you never know, right? Um, let's see, Neo Marilyn Monroe, Gary, are you familiar with Mark Snow and Angelo Badalamenti's work? The no, P I'm not. The P2 soundtrack gives me a feeling of X Files, Twin Peaks, scores, and early Trent Reznor. Well, early Trent Reznor, certainly Twin Peaks was kind of a, uh, I never actually watched Twin Peaks, although everyone tells me I really should. Uh, yeah, it's good but stuff. the thing is, it was, a, that was a contemporary. So we both came, it wasn't me listening to it and, and doing anything with it. It looks like we both came from the same well. Yeah. yeah. You know, all of these. Yeah. I listened a ton to early nine inch nails because that was really great industrial music. And um, believe me, I, I listened to that when I was becoming a sound engineer. I listened to Hurt very, very carefully, and it's beautifully crafted. So yeah, that's all there. But like I said, we were contemporaries. We came yeah. from the same source. Cool. Uh, Mary William, Tarani, Christine, Courtney. <laughs> uh, 
she has a question I think a lot of people want to want to know. And then you told me there's a story that you can share a little bit. But what's the story behind Rage and the Rage lyrics? It sounds like Lorelai took some original lyrics. Can you tell us a little what 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 can you tell us about Rage? Rage was about a woman who wronged me. And the original version of Rage, it was genuine rage. I, it was a fountain of just a volcanic anger. And the lyrics are frankly not something I want to share. Mm -hmm. uh, but the one lyric that, the lyric that really I thought was really good is now you will see all the anger in me. You know, a curse will be upon my name was Lorelai's. There's no room in my heart for forgiveness now. There's only room for rage. Those were from the original. Mm -hmm. And those were the most powerful lyrics and they had to stay. Yeah. Everything else was Lorelai's. And frankly, I do have somewhere around here an old tape with the original rage on it. And I haven't listened to it yet because I'm not quite ready to. Gotcha. That was a really, and I think every, a theory I've always had is people, if you record something and you're really throwing a hard emotion at it, it will get picked up. Mm -hmm. And believe me, what I was channeling everything when I recorded that. Yeah. So what you're hearing about is woman done me wrong anger presented that way. <laughs> uh, you can, you can tell, I mean, people really, really respond to that, to that song. And uh, well, like I said, that's such, I, my, I'm going for the one word emotion. Yeah. man, and, 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 Rage. One, and one single syllable word emotion too. It's just, there's, yeah. not, there's nothing uh, subtle about it. Right. No, it's pure <laughs> wrath. Yeah. Right. Um, Veal, uh, now I'm not sure this is a question, and he's making, he says, Paul will be doing Phantasmagoria 3 or an extended ending of P2, most definitely. So I didn't know that, but apparently that's what I'm going to be doing. Oh, good. Uh, sounds good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> will, and so will you be composing the music? Uh, if it actually is a thing, yes. Sure, let's do it. Okay, I'll definitely do it and you'll definitely do it. Now let's oh, just see if we can get all the, all the, so, Veal, if you can get everything else together, including the money and the budget and the crew and all that stuff, let's let's go. Yeah, well, I'm in. Otherwise, <laughs> me too. Uh, Harrison uh, M. writes, Harry Gary, big fan. The music in P2 is excellent and always reminded me of the similar creepy atmosphere from Videodrome in 1981 by Howard Shore. Are there any horror film soundtracks that you really enjoy? <sighs> yes but I can't put my finger on one at the moment. I, I did come from that well. So you'll, what you're hearing is influenced by a lot of those big horror movies. Like I can't get- I think of I, The Exorcist all the time. To me, well, that's- Well, I can't, yeah. for me, it's, it's um, Poltergeist. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that score is holy shit good. I know it's Hollywood, but that's, that's my deal. That's where I, you know, I come from kind of a film score classical background. I love it. <laughs> but you mentioned Howard Shore. That guy, that, if you recall, was the guy who composed The Lord of the Rings. That's right. That's right. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, Craig Adams, what are your top three bands of all time? Kiss, Devo, and Front 242. Oh, I don't know Front 242. It's a, uh, they call it an EBM, electronic body music. They're from Belgium. Uh, it's the, that's where I got the. Mm -hmm. I remember Kiss. I grew up with them. And then I, I didn't, you know, my, my brother was much more into them and probably still is, or at least still, you know, I, I, I didn't listen to them after, again after a while. But Devo, man, I, I can still not get enough of them. The, the sound that, talk about, you know, you talked about this sort of, they go so big sometimes, you know, it, it's, it's, like, I'd love to hear someone break down the, the many different elements. Man, their track. I've got, I have got every record Devo ever re uh, released. I have gone deep dive on almost every song, but if you want to listen to the perfect Devo song, Devo didn't do it. It's dare to be stupid by weird Al. It is perfect. 
Devo. All of the little composition things that Devo did, Weird Al put them in there. It was oh. it was a beautiful tribute. Oh, got it. It's that perfect. Out. That's awesome. Um, the Pickles. Gary, do you have any interesting stories where you felt it was necessary to record sound samples to create a highly unique sound for a very specific scene? That's a very specific question for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> it is. You know, the fact is, I, I have no doubt that I did. Yeah. Uh, I, I probably did just that, but I don't really have a story because for my money, that's just working. Yeah. You know, all everything you do is like, make it work. How? Mm -hmm. Let's go find out. Right. So right. If, I, if I'm going to record something to, uh, you know, I've probably done like, 50 different examples of that very thing and rejected 48 of them. Mm -hmm. I've got, you know, I've got uh, Harrison who, who sent a, a thing. I'm going to see if I can find this, but we, I th he sent me a file of what is titled the Curtis Jocelyn sex scene, <laughs> but uh, it's a really cool uh, piece. And you may not have heard this in quite a while. So let me see if I can, if I can find this. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Let's see. Actually, I have heard this because that was one of the things that I went on to my composer demo reel. Oh, okay. So you, yeah, I do have that one somewhere. I'm not quite sure where, you know, like yeah. I said, the, the state of storage uh, was weird back then. It's not like you got everything on Google drive and I, right. I don't. Well, I'm going to, I have it here, but I also know that if I share something, it might screw up our, our, our OBS system. So I'll hold off on that for now. But um, uh, so, yeah, and I know that you've, you're, you've got the job, you're all about sound engineering now. Is, is there, is there music in your life besides, is, so in terms of, um, well, tell us, can you talk us through um, uh, the Memphis, uh, Elvis Simmons and the Memphis Strutters? Yeah, talk us through that a little bit. Yeah. That's that's my passion project. That's me keeping in touch with music. And it's it's really become a tremendous part of me. The Elvis Simmons, uh, his the, the character is a couple of drunk junior geneticists spliced the DNA of Elvis Presley and Gene Simmons. And when they'd sobered up, it had worked. Uh, that's not makeup on his face. That's a bunch of recessive genes fighting it out. And what the band does, it's a big band, four horns, three female backup singers, and the other three members of KISS make up guitar, bass, drums. And we do big band versions of KISS songs and heavy metal versions of Elvis songs and whatever the hell else we think is going to be funny. And is the, the big KISS showman in me goes big every time. I mean, thousand people on stage doing really wild ass music. Like we'll say... Um, the beginning of Burning Love, uh, the op opening is Paranoid by Black Sabbath. And we will just yoink from one song to the other. You, uh, the whole point is to never let the audience in on what you're about to do. That sounds uh, so fun. It's, it is a lot of fun. And, you know, I, I cannot begin to tell you how many people have said after seeing uh, our show, that their face hurt from laughing so much <laughs> and that that i read what i read a an interview on uh, uh you know for, for one of your gigs it was it was some you know uh, one of the, the newspapers down in uh oh yeah, yeah. that was good but, but you said something that and I'll, I'll, I'll probably screw it up but you said something that i thought was great where you talked about it starts with people going what the hell is this to being kind of horrified, to getting it and then loving it, and then back to sort. And then you keep you keep maybe making them have to work for, you know, the, you love to mess with people's heads. Absolutely, it, it is it very much. I mean, one of my favorite shows we ever did. We were we were at the Observatory down in Santa Ana. We were um, opening actually for Adler's Appetite. Stephen Adler made a tribute band to his old band. And uh, we're doing Guns N' Roses music, and they weren't sure who to put as an opener. Send Elvis out there. So this room of about 500 people waiting to see Guns N' Roses music. This is Adler formed this band during the height of the uh, reality show craze, you know, and he was on Celebrity Rehab, and that's how he formed the band. Uh, so here comes 
this weird, weird show out on stage and everybody's going, what the hell is this? And I swear they were looking around for cameras pointed at them. But after about the fifth song, they started going, okay, this, this isn't a joke. No, okay, this is a joke, but this is not a joke. They're actually doing this. Yeah, yeah. And that graduated to, did you see what they just did there? <laughs> like we, we did jail, we did uh, breaking the law right into jailhouse rock. Oh my gosh. I mean, and you'd see people out there. It, it was, you knew they were getting it. And once they realized it wasn't just a joke. It was a joke that they were in on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also you went over a crowd that, that didn't know who you were, right? You, oh, you, we do that constantly. Yeah. Um, the, one of the happiest things for me to do is step out on a stage in front of a whole bunch of people who have no idea what's about to happen to them. Uh, I, yeah, you know, I saw, I want to see if I can remember the name of this. Uh, what was it? Uh, who are these guys again? Oh, okay. Oh, so, so you, you, maybe you were there. So back in, maybe it was 92, 94, I don't know, but there was a bumper shoot. Um, and uh, I went to see Violent Femmes. And um, I was in that crowd too. Okay. So it was at the, it was what the key arena was, but mm -hmm. you know, it was before key arena, right? Right. It was a, the crowd was hostile. It was like one of the most hostile crowds I'd ever been in. And because it's it's bumper shoot and you can just wander in, you know, because you paid yeah. your, your cover fee. So everybody's there to see Violent Femmes. And this band I'd never heard of opens up. Uh, people are throwing shoes at them uh, there. And it's and this band just came out. I'm going to tell you who it is in a second. And they just played and they just they they took that energy and they they turned it around and they won this hostile crowd over. It was the bare naked ladies and a band that I, you know, I loved for a while and then kind of lost interest in, but they were young. They hadn't had their first album out and they came out and they knocked it out of the park. And they actually, you could tell that the, by the time the violent femmes came out, there was a, the, the mood had shifted and they had, and then what's his name? Gordon Gano. At one point he was singing a song, one of their songs, and the crowd wasn't into it enough for him. And he goes to the mic and he says, they knew the lyrics in Portland. And, ah! and, and oh my God, people, he pissed so bad that entire crowd off. He lost them <laughs> just like that. People are booing him and throwing shit at oh. him. Oh, that was a crazy night. So the idea of personal like, foul. Yeah. So like the <laughs> idea of being that, that band that opens for somebody and no one knows who you are and your job is to win them over. That can't be easy, but it must be well, incredibly satisfying. It really is, because frankly, we've never failed to do so. Um, and I, I, one of the attitudes that I really liked, we opened three times or four, uh, so uh, three times or more to uh, a, a band down here. It's a tribute band to Oingo Boingo called Dead Man's Party. Ah. And we've opened for them, as I said, several times, but they really liked us opening because they knew that after we got done, people were going to be amped up, happy, and ready to go. And they were a band I respected because they liked being pushed. Yeah. They wanted the opening act to come out and set a bar for them that they have to go get. So now every time I have a band opening for us, especially a bunch of kids, I, I take this one story about Lemmy, uh, Kilmister, uh, really seriously. Uh, Ozzy Osbourne had a bunch of kids that he was sponsoring for a band, uh, a, 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 a children's charity project or something like that. But he said, and they were opening for uh, Mo uh, Motorhead at the Hammersmith Odeon. And Ozzy said, would you mind saying a few words? And, and Lemmy went over there, was very kind to everybody and said, look, mate, your job tonight is to kick our ass. Your job is to come out and take this stage and never give it back all right that went a little south african but anyway <laughs> but anyway he said come on kick my ass bring it that's what i want hit me come on no, that's, that's and they went out and they just owned that place and it, let me said great job and everybody in that audience was ready to go for motorhead yeah and that's what i, I tell that. every band opening for us 
Your you, job is to kick our ass. Have you heard of a, a band called Dread Zeppelin? We've rolled them twice. What do you mean? We, they didn't know who we were the first time. We did an Elvis's birthday thing, and we just blew them off the stage. They oh, wow. They were not ready for our shit. The thing I'm prouder of is the second time we did it, they were ready for our shit. And their, their fans were asking us why we were opening. Wow, that's a there's a high compliment. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, how does people find out? Are there is there a YouTube channel? Is there a way for people to watch your your, uh, your yeah, band? Yeah, just look or- elvissimmons.com or uh, look up Elvis with two S's Simmons. There's a lot of video. There's a lot of stupid crap that we have rolling about, and uh, we're reforming after COVID right now. So it'll be a little bit of time before we can get going. But we're looking for October to get this uh this stupidity uh going again yeah hey gary spinrad thank you so much for joining me today this has been real fun Paul, I, this, this has been awesome thank yeah. you i'm really i'm really happy talking with everybody again it feels like old lost family in a way it does it does and there's so many people that worked on this so many cool people that have yeah. done some cool stuff so what's your take on uh well, before we go like what's your take on the fact that this this game just is still alive and kicking and people are still responding to it and to your work like this. I am so pleased and confused. <laughs> totally. I mean, too. I'm like, so I'm like, I have no, I am so happy. I affected people. And the thing is people get what I was saying yeah. yet in a way, this is kind of an infantile score. If you look at intellectually, but I think like if you, you look said, at like it, Ross said, we can't, you're, you're too into it. You know, you're, you're yeah. too, you, you know, too much, but yeah, kind of, yeah, maybe that's it. But, you know, everyone else seems to have gotten the precise uh, one word emotion I was trying to say. Yeah. yeah. And maybe in that way, I did something very right. Oh, you definitely did. You I definitely did, did absolutely yeah. throw my heart into the score. I jumped in with both feet. You're getting all of Gary Spinrad in this score. Yeah. Well, listen, once we, you know, once Fantas 3 is up and running, I guess, you know, I guess it's happening. So uh, I'll see you in a, in a year or so as we, uh, as we start. <laughs> well, let's see what happens after this. It'll be fun to see if some kind of project uh, emanates from, from these uh, interviews. If not, uh, this is just fun to. Uh, I'll tell you what, P3 it. for me, I would definitely look to repeat those one word emotions but it's going to be a lot more complex because I know a lot more about applied music now. You, you also know more words now. Words. <laughs> All right, Gary. Thanks, Lugubrious. Buddy. That's a good word. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> All right. It's a pleasure. Have a good one, man. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Okay. So I am going to let this be our, our show for today. I I've been meaning to, um, uh, and during the first episode of when I just came out and said hi and to you guys, I, I did a project or an ep, not an episode, but a segment that I thought was going to be a running theme where I was going to show you guys my Hollywood career, which is like six movies with, you know, just a couple lines here and there. And each episode was going to just, I was going to share with you my, uh, you know, my Buffy the Vampire Slayer or my Drew Carey show and stuff. It just hasn't worked out, um, but people have asked me if I would do that again. So I think in an upcoming episode, I will string a bunch of those together so I can share some of that with you just in a, in a fun way. But uh, I feel like we've had a very full meal today and uh, I think uh, I'm gonna call it a day. So thank you all for joining. Um, I do wanna just ask again to please consider um, joining us on Patreon or supporting Conversations with Curtis in some way to help me continue this project, uh, which is just getting better and better as we go. And uh, until then, uh, thanks for everything. And I will be announcing uh, next month's guest who I have locked down already and uh, very excited to share with you guys in the in the coming weeks. Uh, but until then, have a great rest of your weekend. And uh, thanks so much for, for joining me. And uh, I guess that's it. I can't think of anything else. So off I go. Take care.